morning or good afternoon, depending where in the world you're signing in from today. I'm fortunate today to be joined by Stephen Rentschler, Nevada Lithium CEO and Director, as well as Jeff Wilson, the company's VP Exploration. How are you both doing today? Okay. How are you doing, Bianca? Can never complain. Looking forward to today's event. Uh, and speaking of, today, uh, this is the format that we're going to be having for today's event. We'll start with a quick presentation from Steve and Jeff, and then we'll jump into audience questions, starting with the questions sent in advance via email and then the questions from the live chat. If for whatever reason we don't get to your question today, I'll pass that along to the Nevada Lithium team and they'll get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, today's event is being recorded and the replay will be available shortly. But without further ado, I will pass it over to Steve. Super. Thanks so much. Thanks to everybody for taking the time to listen. Uh, normally, we try to do a video on the day on which we do a news release. Uh, however, this news release came out last week, and I was at the Benchmark uh, Critical uh, Minerals Conference in Los Angeles. So we couldn't quite pull that off. However, the timing was pretty good. We had hoped it would be so that while I was there, we would have the ability to showcase uh, this report, this updated resource report, which is, is quite honestly, it's, it's, it's remarkable. It's eye-opening. And um, I'll just take you back, uh, even though Bianca says it'll be a short presentation, as always, we, at least I tend to get a long-winded, but it's worthwhile sort of going back, telling the story again quickly, because I know we have a lot of new people who are taking interest in the story. And uh, to take a minute and just sort of show the path, the way forward that we've come and where we're planning to go, I think makes a lot of sense. The highlights of, of the report that we released on, on Tuesday put us, I think, in a league of our own. In particular, you know, this was a resource report that drastically increased an already very, very big tonnage of lithium that we had at Bonnie Claire. It drastically increased the grade of what we are calling our resources, which now include indicated as well as inferred. And it gave us our first boron resource. And to put this all in context, this is the culmination of essentially marrying the last two drilling campaigns that we had with our initial resource report. And this is was a, it was a world class deposit in my mind, certainly from the beginning. But now we've just we've catapulted ourselves into a whole nother realm. And you can argue about whether or not this is the biggest in Nevada, the U.S., the highest grade, the biggest Nevada, the U.S., all these sorts of things. It doesn't matter. We have so much material. We have such high grade material. I'll try to sort of parse out why I think that's important as I come to the end of my uh, of, of my comments. But <clears throat> suffice to say, <clears throat> if you think back to, to what we had at, at Bonnie Claire, and remember, again, just to set the stage, right? We're about two and a half hours northwest of Vegas. We're on State Route 95. We're all by ourselves. The town of Beatty is about 30 miles to the southeast. Uh, we have Area 51 on our right flank by about 20 miles. We've got the Death Valley that's on our left flank by about 20 miles. Nobody around us, right? R literally, the, the, the gate to the property is on Route 95. We've got power lines going on top of us. We've got no endangered species. Uh, flora, fauna, we have no indigenous cultural problems that we have to worry about. We have this entire massive land package all to ourselves, not flanked by anybody. And over the course of the past few years, obviously, we've been drilling on this and trying to advance the PEA and then get to a PFS. But what occurred as we started to drill deeper is we hit a different type of mineralization which essentially started to provide these assays that were remarkable with regards to their lithium grade. And whereas before maybe we were hitting 2000 plus PPM type of lithium, and again, these are sediments. This is not a brine, it's not a hard rock. This is a very soft clay type of a deposit like Thacker Pass or Rhyolite Ridge. But as we were, you know, 2000 PPM starting to get a little higher as we went deeper, we started hitting these massive intercepts of 3,000 ppm, 4,000, 5,000 ppm as we went deeper and deeper. And essentially, we didn't want to sterilize or mean we end up building something on top of our best mineralization. So we kept going deeper as we kept stepping out, trying to find what the extents uh, of this mineral mineralization was. But we'd never been able to quantify what the effect was on our resource. Again, going back, we had slightly under half of what we have now. I mean, it is, it's, tr it's tremendous, the increase. I should say another way to say it is I think we have almost 90% more than we had before. And, and the grade has uh, tripled, right? It's that kind of stuff, that kind of high grade that's going on. 
And s rather than just going through all the numbers, so many hundreds of meters of this, or, or so many, you know, millions of tons or whatever, it's all, it's all in the news release. You would need to, to read it closely anyway, to frankly, to sort it out. I just conceptually want you to think about it like this. Originally, we had a club sandwich here at Bonnie Claire, and let's just call it for, just to make it even more simple, it's a tuna club, okay? So we got three pieces of bread, we got tuna on the top layer, we got tuna on the bottom layer. The top layer would be where you would open pit something if you wanted to, but that's never what we were really gonna do here at Bonnie Claire because of our proposed mining method, which is borehole mining, which lets us get down to the bottom layer of tuna. However, at a given lithium price, that top layer of tuna very probably could be economic in a different part of Bonnie Claire because of the way that the geology sort of lays in a shallower part. We've been exploring what's going on in the bottom layer of lithium. And the way I want you to think about it, that original club sandwich was, you know, piece, three pieces of rye bread, whatever. All of a sudden, as we kept drilling, now we, if you went to Subway, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's called a hoagie shop in the U.S. You got a six-incher on your hand, right? So it's starting to elongate. And what else is happening is the bottom part of the, of the sandwich, where the tuna, which is the lithium is, is starting to get thicker. So it's starting to get a little bit floppy there on the bottom part, getting thicker. The symmetry of the sandwich isn't there. And we kept drilling, and now we got a foot long, okay, at, at Subway. And the tuna is now, we could basically hold it in our hands because of what's happening in the bottom layer. And now there's a bunch of cheese in there, which is boron. All of this has come to fruition basically after two years. And this is the first time we've ever seen the extent of it. We also have the opportunity to keep going in three directions. And if you're looking at me, basically it would be look to your left, it's still open, which means that we could drill there. Pretty sure that we would find more of the high grade mineralization. You could look behind me and we drill there, we should still be able to find more mineralization. And if you look to my other direction to the right, you would say, well, we could find more there. We will never have a problem with having enough resource at Bonnie Claire. This is a monster that we have, and we have more than enough to do what we wanna do, which is basically work towards an updated PEA. And that, I believe that we are on track to finish that at the end of Q1, so end of March, 2025. Currently, what we're doing with that is having floor work on the metallurgical work. We announced um, not too long ago that we engaged them these are the folks that did the recovery flow sheet at Rylite Ridge. They've worked on other massive projects internationally known. These are the people that you want to have involved going forward with the project. They're going to give us essentially something different than when we had in the old PEA, which was a calcination approach to, to um, recovering the lithium, which meant you, you heated it up, you put sodium sulfate on it, you washed it out with water, do some other things. And remember, we proved that we could do battery-grade lithium carbonate. Because of that very, very uh, thick tuna intercept along with the cheese in the bottom, we got to change our recovery process. And Flora already said, okay, on a preliminary uh, basis, we know that we can get 98% of the boron and 97% of the lithium out of it. Those will not be the final numbers. I don't want people to think that. Even I know at this stage of the game that, that that's too good. That just means that for using a weak acid right now, we know we can separate the lithium and the boron out of the mineralization. And I have very, very high confidence in floor that they will be able to give us essentially a conventional sulfur recovery uh, type of a system. I, I truly believe it's gonna be something that is very similar to Ioneer's Rhyolite Ridge because of course, Rhyolite Ridge has got lithium and boron. Though I frankly would think about um, Rhyolite Ridge is being a boron, uh, a boron mine with, with lithium, whereas we are absolutely the other way around. Uh, our lithium values are, are multiples higher of, say, Rhyolite Ridges, and our boron ton tonnages are up there, even though our grades aren't as high. From my perspective, if we can just get the boron out without increasing our costs, that gives us the accessibility to the high grade lithium, then we're ahead of the game. If we can get something for the boron, and all I will tell you right now is that the boron uh, markets are very opaque, but if we can get anything at all above that, that's just absolutely icing on the cake for our costs. Now, uh, before I turn it over to Jeff, I just wanted to mention that with regards to sort of the updated resource report, in my mind, what's the most important is the grades. And if you look at the tables and look at the cutoffs and look at the average grades, et cetera, what you'll quickly see, I think, is that you'll get the flavor of the fact that 
if we high grade this mine, which means if we can get right down to where the very highest grades are, that will absolutely maximize the economic impact and the update, updated PEA. Right? It's, it's like in any other mining, if you think about it, if you've got a ton of material, but you got three times the stuff in it that you had before, you process the same amount, you still put the ton through, but your, your, your output is three times higher. Your unit costs are going to go down, all sorts of things. This is going to give us tremendous flexibility in terms of how we look at this updated PEA. And I will tell everybody that what we're going to do is look at everything from a smaller throughput option to a bigger uh, through, throughput option. And the reason I say that is we've seen a number of projects over the course, let's call it the past year, they're coming in with multi-billion dollar uh, capital expenditures that are necessary up front. And the markets don't really like them. I will tell you that, you know, 25 years in the past, there was certainly a time when um, strategic investors wanted to have those big types of projects. In fact, they preferred them because they could continue to put their money into them, reinvest them at a very high internal rate of return. Right now, we're not going through that uh, in the markets. So we want to have some flexibility. We're talking uh, very frequently to both Floor and to GRE, who will be doing the updated uh, PEA for us um, to make sure that we've examined all the options, right? And then we'll make a decision with the board of directors, et cetera, which ones we want to present to the market, et cetera, because the key ultimately after P the updated PEA is then to launch right into PFS. And of course, then you're really going to start to look for project financing. So we have to take into account what's going on uh, you know, which essentially market sentiment about how these uh, these uh, projects are going to be financed, because even though we all see the the news of the of the loans that are coming in from the Department of Energy for, you know, Ioneer for Thacker Pass, those are at the end. Like we have to get there. We still have a couple of steps to get there. You know, the next step is, of course, the updated uh, PEA at the end of March. Uh, I'm going to let Jeff talk more about uh, about the deposit right now, just to maintain co some continuity, and then I'll finish up uh, after Jeff has done, give you some more thoughts about the next steps that we have, uh, as well as you know what I learned, gleaned, whatever you want to say uh, at that Benchmark Minerals Conference in Los Angeles, because I think there are some interesting things going on. So uh, Jeff, I'll, let me hand this over to you right now. If you could show people what you know what we got, we think is going on at Bonnie Claire. <laughs> Sure. So rather than bombard everybody with more um, facts and figures, I'll maybe just show everybody what it looks like uh, on the screen. Okay. Okay. Can everybody see the cornfield? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me just hide that. Okay, so in what we have here, I'm looking at an oblique view of our property boundary. The green blob yeah, you can see there is the outline of the 900, um, 900 ppm uh, uh, grade shell. Okay, This thing is about five kilometers north-south and about three kilometers uh, east-west. What we have are two deposits. We have one at the surface that Stephen has talked about, you know, around about 1,000 ppm, and then the lower deposit at around 3,000 ppm. The drill holes uh, you can see are in the, the blue there. And I'll just switch to uh, a cross section. So this is kind of an east-west uh, cross section. You have the upper zone, which is dominantly within the upper claystone, around about 1,000 ppm. Um, and this is the 900, gram, 900 uh, ppm grade shell. And then you have a lower, uh, slightly um, uh, easterly dipping um, deposit, the lower zone we're calling that. Um, this is a 900 and, and then the 1800 ppm. 900 we chose because it's comparable to open pit uh, competitors. 1800 we chose because um, the, the underground, sort of the borehole mining parameters would indicate that that's a realistic, a realistic number. Uh, and as you can see, the, the we have the lithium along the the uh, along the drills up to 6,000 ppm, dominantly in the lower part of our of our deposit. And you can see that the boron in the graphs along the side kind of exists sort of co uh, concurrently with the uh, with the lithium in this lower zone. And um, and as you can see. <clears throat> 
uh, it does come up towards the surface on the east, on the west side, sorry. In the east, it's still open in this direction. Again, we don't have a lot of drilling to the north, uh, but it should be open. Uh, it, it's certainly open to the north and then to the south. We currently have no drilling and it's open uh, to the south. Okay, so that just, oops, that just gives you an idea as to as to where we are uh, with regard to that. Beautiful. So spatially, you can see, all right, uh, what we were talking about with the shallower <clears throat> material, again, top layer tuna, open pit. By putting it into the resource, we just, we wanted to make sure that people didn't forget that we had it. Uh, it was not a, of an inconsequential size. However, it doesn't mean that we need to develop that or would be in a mine plan in our updated PEA. We develop it in an open pit and then get to the higher grade material. That's not at all. It's in there to show the optionality and the way that basically that shallow material is going. To me, in my mind, and I think I've said this for a couple of years now, if it were ever to come to an open pit, it would be to the west. It would be towards the western boundary of the property as everything tilts up towards the surface. And, of course, we're going to the east, to the south, potentially to the north, uh, as, as basically the technical team is, is looking to find sort of the, the, the bottom, the G, I guess the low in here, where, again, this blanket of lithium might have had its thickest accumulation. So I don't want people to think that all of a sudden an open pit is part of what we're advocating for here in the development. This is still the hydraulic borehole mining. Uh, we had Kinley Exploration do an advanced study on this again over the summer. They say getting down to these depths is no problem at all. You know, in terms of, again, just drilling a vertical hole. This is in a very simplistic uh, explanation, but essentially drill a vertical hole and rotate the drill string with high pressure water on. And again, because that material is so soft, like you can crush this with your hands from, you know, stuff that comes up from 3,000 feet in, in depth. That water will erode that material and cause a slurry, and we will pump it all back up to the surface. And again, remember, we're not talking about shipping stuff off to, to be upgraded. You know, that's the analog to the hard rock that you hear about in Australia and Quebec, where, you know, you, you make a concentrate and then you send it to a refiner or whatever they're going to do and, and get your carbonate or your hydroxide or whatever. This project, again, would be a, a beginning to end um, finished battery material, whether it's carbonate or hydroxide, or interestingly enough, maybe something different. Uh, and here's where I'll just jump into some of the things that I learned at the Benchmark uh, Minerals Conference. So, you know, th this is Benchmark Minerals is, is arguably one of the two, if not the premier, let's call it research houses uh, in critical minerals and, and lithium. They in fast markets I have no problem naming either one of them. Very, very smart people. Uh, and they, you know, they have a flagship conference uh, every year in Los Angeles and about 450 people, 500 people came, you know, everybody from the banks to companies like ours, uh, to investors, et cetera. But you hear uh, a lot of the talk from the uh, scientific experts, uh, a lot of battery talk, quite honestly. And uh, one of the things that I, that I noticed and was talked to about uh, by people coming up to me is sort of the advance of the, the solid state batteries coming in. This is a couple of years away, but you know, one of the materials that will go into that will be lithium chloride, uh, as opposed to necessarily the hydroxides or the carbonates. And the reason I bring it up is it's potentially a third thing that we, we could look at as we do uh, the updated PEA. Remembering flexibility is just of massive importance in, in this um, industry. And the reason is because you're basically building an industry from essentially nothing. You've heard me say this many times before, but starting a couple of years ago, 500,000 tons a year lithium carbon equivalent out to what they were projecting in 2030 at, you know, uh, 2.5 2. to 3 to 3.5 million tons. It doesn't matter. It's all way too much. You know, compounded annual growth rates at 2025. You can't build industries that quick, which means, in my opinion, you'll have persistent upward uh, pressure on prices, which obviously is good for our project. But the point is, all of this is going to continue. Nothing has changed. Uh, people were asking, obviously, about what happened, what would happen because of the, uh, the U.S. Uh, presidential elections. And I will tell you, I listen as much as anybody to other people's opinions. I've been 
pretty adamant, I think, about mining consistent. I didn't think there would really be any changes. If in fact the EV mandate is lifted, I don't see a big I don't see a big change because I don't think it could ever have gotten to the point where the lithium supply could have could have you know basically satisfied the demand even if it was imposed. I frankly don't even think the cars would have been there. Um, so given that, I think that the focus has gone on the U.S. wanting to secure, right, mineral supplies, right, just want to secure domestic supply lines that cannot be interrupted. And you'll see that uh, the U.S. government just added copper to its list of critical materials. Again, recognizing the importance, not only just for, you know, EVs and global electrification, you know, all these AI um, uh, data centers that are coming on tremendous power draws that are, that are, are uh, being projected. And of course, like Nevada is, is busy trying to build out their infrastructure to handle that as well as the mines that are coming on. So the point is, even though again, lithium uh, market prices are still call it ten, eleven thousand dollars and spot in China, I would argue who cares because that's not the, the price that's ever going to be used in the non-China world for the for the IRA tax credits. And again, I will say again, as a U.S. citizen, just sort of watching politics, I don't see how they, that that those uh, tax credits could be reversed. There were political careers that were essentially thrown away to get that legislation over the over the line. So if things slow down a little bit, I don't think that's a tremendous problem, frankly, for the industry. And I don't think anything in the long term has changed. In fact, we have other sources, whether it's stationary storage with alternative energy, you know, you can pick a number of things, but the technology is advancing very, very quickly uh, and the efficiencies are getting better, which is better for the economics, et cetera. And all of this leads to a better outlook for lithium going forward. So I, I would not be worried about that. Now, as we go forward, you know, this is what I, I think that you should look for. Again, next step for Nevada lithium is going to be the updated preliminary economic as assumption. Now, uh, the way it works uh, under the Canadian reporting rules is as soon as we came out with that research report, uh, or pardon me, the 43-101 technical report that showed the updated resource, right, now, now we can't talk about the old PEA, right? Subsequently, we will update that PEA and then we'll Back to, we'll be back to talking about economics. However, I do know, and you could still prove this to yourself, uh, by looking at the old one, which the old PEA, which is still up on, on CDAR, I mean, that's going to remain there. You'll see that we have a number of levers to throw to increase basically, you know, the, um, the, the results, let's just say that way, you know, the results that we want to see coming out of the updated PEA. And I've talked about this before, we'll be using a higher uh, lithium price. So that's certainly going to help. Uh, capital expenditures, I know that they're going to go up because of the, the level of detail and we've had inflation that's going in over the course of the last three years, et cetera. So that's not going to be a surprise. But I want people to focus on what that high grade material allows us to do. Again, just simply going back to, you know, if you think about it, you got a ton of dirt that you're throwing through it and it's got a multiple of whatever material you want in there. If it's got two times the lithium, two and a half, I don't know what the answer is gonna be right now, but I'm fairly confident that it's gonna be significantly higher than what we had going through previously. That is going to have a tremendous impact on economics. And again, just to sort of tie it all together, understanding that the market circle gonna wanna see sort of the spectrum from uh, something that doesn't blow our socks off in terms of uh, you know a high annual thro uh, throughput, um, but looking at something that we could bootstrap ourselves up that we know would be financeable. We're gonna go all the way through from one end of the spectrum to the other um, as you know over the course of the next couple of months to get that updated PEA out. From there, the next step would be preliminary feasibility study. If all of the chips fall into place, and that includes financing, we will be having to drill more holes to continue to raise the level of statistical confidence in our resources, right, from inferred to indicated. That will require, I don't know, eight, 10 drill holes, something in that order. And that's using the assumptions from the last PEA. But it gives me a good sort of planning, um, you know, place to start. And then the other question will be a test of the borehole mining, which we still think will be necessary, um, pretty sure, uh, to accomplish the PFS. There's a possibility it might not, 
But if it is necessary, that will take some long range uh, planning that we're starting to look at right now, permitting to be specific. And that's an expensive test. So the way in which we finance that is going to be obviously something that is going to depend upon how much dilution we want to take uh, take on. But that, if, if everything went right, I would say conservatively, you know, we would be ready in two years time, somewhere around the spring, I would say, of 2026 uh, with PFS that's finished. And then uh, at that point in time, we could be marketing, uh, I would say, with a step change, let's just put it that way. People's confidence in something with a PFS versus a PEA is markedly different. But I think that would be the next stepping stone, big stepping stone for Nevada Lithium. Uh, and from there, of course, uh, with PFS uh, finished, you launch into a uh, feasibility study, you're permitting the BLM, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and the groundwork for all of that is already being laid out in terms of environmental studies, community relations, all these sorts of things that you want to show years you know, of sort of continuity uh, to the best uh, that you can to basically ease into that final stage. And of course, that's the stage where you would, you know, you would be looking to get those government loans that we've all seen, you know, again, with Pioneer and with Thacker Pass. So that's the overall game plan. Uh, I hope everybody sees the significance of this latest resource report. I will just tell you, if you if you peruse the other lithium companies uh, today, somebody uh, released a, a preliminary a feasibility study, one of the allegedly biggest ones out there, and they claimed that they were the biggest in, in North America. And a very, very simple read of, of their introduction or introductory page will, will show you that they're nowhere close to what we have at, at Bonnie Claire. So given all that, as I promised, I would not be short-winded. Uh, Bianca, why don't you take it from here? And if we have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them as best we can. Amazing. Well, I'm happy to say we have tons of questions. Uh, so I will dive right into them. Some of them might be a bit of a rehash of uh, your presentation, but good for folks who maybe are tuning in a little late. Uh, a question we have a few times here is, will we need to raise any additional capital to complete the PA or the PFS? Uh, the PEA, we're going to be okay on. So that was taken care of a while ago. Again, um, if you look over the course of the past year and a half, you'll see that we have um, uh, two new substantial uh, shareholders uh, who, along with prior shareholders, have been very, very strong proponents of the company, and we raised that money to get us through the PEA. So we're going to be fine with that. PF, PFS is definitely going to require more money. The question is going to be in what form. You've heard me talking about trying to get offtake uh, from OEMs. Obviously, I continue to, to talk with them. I will tell you, all you have to do is look at car sales around the world to know that they are in a world of hurt right now. It, frankly, in my opinion, to some of their own doing because of COVID, but be that as it may, um, you know, it's not conducive right now for that. Uh, so even though I continue to talk and hope, We'll have to see what happens. We have a little bit of time, but there are different ways to finance these things. Um, but for PFS, we're going to definitely require more money. Diving into the PA again, um, there's a question here that asks, what lithium oxide equivalent and boron price will be utilized in the PEA? We don't know yet. We, uh, we know in the resource report, we went up to $20,000 uh, a ton for lithium carbonate. Um, and I'm trying to remember what the price was for boron, and I don't think it was bor uh, I don't think it was boron ox oxide either. Either, um, however, those are two questions precisely that we're going to continue to go over with, with, with GRE because again, the PFS uh, today that came out I saw had a lithium carbon price of twenty four thousand dollars a ton. So I will tell you that in Nevada, we've seen all sorts of pre preliminary feasibility studies, PEAs, et cetera, it's somewhere in 20 to 24,000 for lithium. But boron, but boron, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. On the PFS side of things, there's a question here that asks, uh, do our resources need to be measured for a PFS or is indicated resources sufficient? Indicated. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Jeff, it's yours. Indicated, measured and indicated either is fine to support mine planning. Beautiful. There you, there you have it. Um, another question here about water rights. The question asks, do we expect to obtain water rights next year? Uh, I don't know when we're going to actually obtain water rights. I will tell you that we're having discussions with, with various entities. Um, and there, look, water is going to be an issue 
um, throughout Nevada. Again, we're starting from a position where in our hydrographic basin, uh, there, there's no other use for the water, right? It's not potable. It's, it's already brine. And I don't mean lithium bearing brine. I just mean it's salty water. It's brine. So it can't be used for agricultural uh, purposes, et cetera. And the details of the water loss and, you know, the kinds of things that we're doing, I would just tell you right now, we take up a whole nother seminar. So we're talking to people. I'm not going to talk about exactly what we're going to do because I know certain people are on these calls. They have been traditionally who are not necessarily looking to make things easy for us with regards to water rights. So I think I'm, I'm just going to leave it at that and say we're well aware of what needs to be done with water rights. I've talked to private individuals, talking to state entities, et cetera. Um, and we'll do our best to, to do what we can uh, going forward as quickly as we can. A uh, question here about the hydraulic borehole mining method. They're asking when the first one will be performed. But I think you've already uh, you've done a little bit this past spring. So maybe just diving into that method a little bit more. Well, yeah, it's a, it can be a little confusing, right? So the, the hydraulic borehole mining is will be the mining method, <clears throat> and and we haven't done it yet. Uh, this will will be a will be a full blown test uh, as we think about it now uh, for a preliminary feasibility study. What I'm hoping, if we, if we could do it by, would be essentially by the end of this year. Uh, pardon me, the end of 2025. We're not in 2025 yet. Um, and th there's weather involved, et cetera. We, first hurdle is to get over the permitting, uh, which I know it's not the same as permitting a, a drill hole. Now, it might get done very quickly, but I'm just going to be conservative about this um, because it's something that's out of the ordinary. Remember, borehole mining has been done. Uh, in other parts of the world, or very, very similar. Some people have said, well, it's not exactly borehole mining. Okay, everything has got a, a little bit of a variation on it. So you're going to say Cameco, you know, they they, they might uh, get their, their material out of their, you know, uh, the underground um, structure a little bit different in terms of bringing it up. They don't pump it up, but they're accessing it exactly the same way. Denison looks like it's going to be exactly the same way, et cetera. So, you know, again, it's going to be a pretty big test. Again, we, we, this is not going to be drill a hole, you know, that's say 12 inches in diameter and that goes all the way down to the bottom and we're taking assays, right? This would be to literally excavate the material. And I don't know if it's going to be a 30 foot wide radius or 10 foot wide radius, what, you know, but it's going to remove material. And by the way, that material will be able to use stockpile, potentially put it through a pilot plant in terms of helping with regards to, uh, you know, uh, working on the uh, feasibility of the, of the recovery flow sheet that floor has been putting together. But almost think of it as test mining, because really that's what it's going to be. And that's why the permitting is going to be, you know, so important and so different than what we're doing right now. And of course, the cost, it's no secret. I've said this to people, you know, the latest estimate we have is like 10 to 12 million US dollars. I'm sure that's not going to get cheaper in terms of the absolute cost. If we can defer certain costs, from sharing it with people or by going to the government. And here's something that it is a little bit new that I forgot to talk about in my prepared rem remarks. I was approached by consultants again, and I understand they're consultants. However, uh, in Washington, it seems as if there has been a bit of a change uh, in the legislation regarding the IRA and how you can access funds, again, predominantly for technology with regards to, you know, securing mineralization and battery companies, all this sort of stuff. But this time to make it accessible to those who are trying to develop the mining side of this. And so I'm already uh, basically following up with discussions, uh, you know, with those folks to see if, in fact, that looks like that has become a viable option. I do know from preliminary discussions, it would take at least a year from when the new tranche of financing becomes available. So it's not like, you know, you know, and you really wouldn't know too six months into it, whether or not you were going to be successful. But I have to gather a little bit more information, talk to the board about it, whether or not we want to pursue this, because that would be all of a sudden a possibility to get some funds in, you know, anything at all to try to defray the cost of that borehole mining test. So, um, yeah, we have to stay tuned. But unfortunately, we haven't done any of it yet. We have to rely on the experience of others. And, and we do know that that's been a positive experience for others. All right. This next question I'm going to do my best. I apologize if I butcher any of these technical terms. Uh, but the question is, as far as we know, boron is fixed in borosilicate material, a mineral, and lithium is found in the form of another silicate mineral. There does not exist any similarity with Serbian jaredite. Is it 
possible that your deposit ha has lithium in the form of diatrital leopetalite? Um, I guess uh, I'll answer that. Uh, we're currently doing, you know, a fair amount of metallurgy and, and petrography with fluor uh, enterprises who we've hired to do the metallurgy. Um, at the moment, our best guess for the uh, uh, for the lithium is that it's bound in elite, which is a non-swelling clay, and then the um, the boron is likely bound up in serlazite, which is a uh, a borosilicate mineral, which is a which is common to the Ionier rhyolite ridge uh, um, property as well. So it doesn't really have much to do with uh, with jadeite and the, the serpent deposit. Awesome, thank you. Um, another question here, dollar for dollar, how does boron value compare to the lithium value? Uh, right now, it's I think boron's a little bit lower uh, than lithium, but this goes back to sort of the opacity of what I was talking about with boron markets. Um, you know, Rio's, Rio Tinto is a big player uh, in boron, not only in California, um, but in Serbia. Uh, Yadar was going to be, you know, a big, um, a big source of, of boron, obviously, because of the Yadarite. And in terms of, it's, it's also going to be a much smaller market, we think, as you look out a, a couple of years, you know, to when the EVs are really here, and then you're talking about 3 million tons of, you know, lithium, whatever, something like that. I think it's going to be less. And it looks like they're also just starting to come up with some of the uses. I mean, I've seen it in uh, and armor, uh, you know, boron obviously is an essential element in fertilizers, even though it's sort of a trace element. If you put too much boron, you'll kill your crops. But it's, you know, it's just a very, very cloudy thing to look forward into. And that's why I'm saying it's very important to remember, we're not going to be looking to that boron to make the economics of Bonnie Claire. It's, it's why I was saying, too, if I can, you know, if we can just get it out, you know, without too much of a cost or any cost, we're way ahead of it because our high uh, grade lithium, that real high five, 6,000 PPM stuff seems to coexist, you know, at least in terms of a stratigraphical, um, you know, le levels with the boron. So we want to be able to separate it, get it out, but we're not going to count on that revenue. Anything would be gravy. And I wish I could say more about it, but I, I tell you, I just don't feel comfortable um, I, I have to talk to more banks about that. The ones that I have talked to have basically told me what I just told you. So um, in the coming months, as I learn more, I'll, I'll be sure to share it with everybody. Yeah, and I'll, I, I'd just like to echo that, that, um, you know, when we're talking to the external consultants, their impression is that the boron is nice to have, but it's the lithium, which is the real, uh, the real money maker. Yeah. If I heard correctly, um, there's a question here about, is more test drilling before PFS needed, uh, before the PFS uh, is completed? Yeah, I mean, um, at the moment, the bulk of our resource, the 25 million uh, tons of LCE are in, indicate, are in inferred uh, category. Uh, so we need to tighten up the drilling um, to to uh, to do that. At the moment, we're talking, the, the the drill holes are, let's say, four to five hundred meters apart, and we need to tighten that up to, you know, one hundred and seventy to two hundred meters to go from inferred to indicated. And with an indicated resource, that's sufficient to uh, give you a mineral reserve and support mine planning. And the other, the other thing I would just follow up on that again is remember, I mean, we're talking five million tons already indicated. And I think it was just the two holes, right? That gave us the indicated, but the 25 million, if we were to bring, a, you know, a large percentage of that up to uh, indicated with the infill drilling, which I assume we would, remember, this is a quantity of lithium that is so large. It's not that we would necessarily build the mega project, right? I mean, this kind of a resource would support tremendous throughput, right? Everything this, the, Think of the biggest lithium project you can out there, and we could easily be that big with a 40-plus year mine life, remembering again that you stop counting after 40 years because the economics are so de, de minimis in the net present value. But what it does is it gives us the flexibility. It's these, it's these massive columns of this very, very high-grade mineralization, which, right, that is tailored to a borehole mining technique where, again, you think about it, you get down as quickly as possible into those high grade areas 
And that's where you start bringing up the material. So you could theoretically change your, your mind plan around, right? Find your areas with, with the very thickest intercepts. And we'll find them, of course, through more of the infill drilling. And that's where you start. And again, you might start, maybe only start with one borehole because the grade is so high, as opposed to two. That's the ultimate flexibility. I mean, the way I'm looking at it, just so everybody is clear, is, you know, we'll be talking to floor. What's the minimum sort of size that you can put on the back end of something for what we want to do? Previously, right, we were talking about 32,000 tons uh, out of the old PEA. I'm not supposed to be able to talk about, but that's, it, it is what it is. Here, it might be more modular, right? If the, if the markets are saying, hey, we want to finance stuff that's more of a bootstrap approach, we want to set this up so that we can present that, basically that investment proposition to them. The resource here is not, it's not going to be an issue. This stuff just goes on and on and on. And I'm secure in saying that, and I'm not a geologist. So, sorry, Bianca, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> no, you're good. Um, there was a mention earlier around a weak acid. Uh, what type of acid will you be using? Sulfuric looks at right, Jeff. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, another question: Do you anticipate occurrence of subsidence? You want to talk about that, Jeff? Uh, sure. I mean, we'll have a better idea of that uh, once we do the pilot plant. Um, but the external consultants are saying that um, it's so deep that y you might see a certain amount of subsidence, but it wouldn't be large. You know, we'll have a better idea once we've done the pilot plant. And when you say pilot plant, Jeff, you, you mean the borehole mining test? Yes. Okay. The, the, yeah. The, yeah, the pilot borehole mining test. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's okay. Yeah, we've heard, remember too, we've got this very, very large, that sandstone, Jeff, what is that, 500, 700 feet um, that's stuck in the middle? It's, yeah, that's a thousand feet. Yeah, a lot more competent than the material that we're talking about, you know, using the borehole mining in. So it remains to be seen, but, you know, will that act as a support so that you don't get the subsidence uh, at the top? Or again, as Jeff said, is it so minimal that you barely notice it? I've had, you know, Richard Kern, have heard him talk about, uh, you know, the wind's going to blow in over the desert. You know, Steve, the stuff is all going to go back to flat. Yeah, I get it. So, you know, in the grand scheme of things, though, we're not expecting to see anything uh, much happen at surface. But we have to we have to continue to test. Another technical question. So again, bear with me. I will do my best. Uh, is there any zeolite such as clinophytolite uh, and or mordonite associated with the lithium and boron minerals in order to assume the existence of an old saline alkaline lake environment of deposition? The main zeolite that we see from the quantitative XRD is uh, analcim and that might be hydrothermal. Um, uh, that's our best guess at the moment. Bear in mind that the, the rock which hosts the mineralization is predominantly sub 10 micron. So the conventional sort of mineralogy um, sort of visualization tools are of limited use. I think as time goes on, we'll have a better handle on that. But at the moment, um, uh, serlazite and, uh, and analcim appear to be at least partially hydrothermal. Uh, so uh, whether it's a, we, we were assuming it's a dry lake bed of some kind. I mean, these are unconsolidated sediments, partially partially consolidated sediments within a, an active basin, so. Excellent. We've had a few different versions of this question, so I'll, I'll try to consolidate. Um, are we looking to sell lithium as a commodity or Nevada Lithium as a company, and what would be the timeline for any of those sort of catalysts? I, I think I think what what's being asked is sort of do we need to build it, or is there an exit off ramp here a little earlier? And and I'll go because nothing's changed. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just go over it again with regards to sort of the way we look about this. You know, whenever you develop a natural you know resource asset. You're always asked, well, you know, do you have to build it? You say, well, you know, or could you build it? Well, sure, you could assemble the team, you could do it. You know, you, you have the, the time frame, you go through all the steps, PEA, PFS, feasibility study, permitting, you know, raise everything, et cetera. You have a net present value of that, of that project, and you would assume over time, right, that the value of the company accretes towards that net present value. Or it could go to a multiple of that. I've seen that many times before, particularly in the gold industry. And then if, as you go forward into production, you know, then you, the, the company becomes rated on a, a multiple of earnings as any other conventional company would. 
Is that a possibility? Absolutely. But we're not close to that part yet. There are other ways to get shareholder value out. They trade off one thing for another. If you take sort of the same net present value or close to it that you would get, let's just say, in pre-feasibility study, and somebody, say a strategic, maybe it's a mining house, maybe it's an energy company, could be anybody, wants to come along and wants to, to buy this uh, from you as an asset, you tr you traditionally you get some percentage of, the, of an agreed upon net present value. And I'm making this up, but maybe it's 0.3 or 0.4. It depends on where we are. It depends on, upon how attractive the asset is, how much uh, upside there is. And believe me, Bonnie Claire ticks the boxes on all of this. But you know, you're not getting the full value, but by the same token, you're getting that value, if you get 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 of net present value, right? Years ahead of where you would be getting it if you build it, right? Without a lot of dilution. Remember, when you get to the, let's call it the end of these processes, where you're really getting down to the loans and all this stuff, you got to raise a lot of equity as well. You know, if it's traditionally two thirds debt and one third equity, you'd be talking about a lot of, you know, a lot of extra shares. So there's different ways to look at it. What I would say is I don't think that the board would really be interested in right now is looking at this and selling it as an in situ resource. You see this at very early stages with companies with, you know, just sort of a simply, hey, we've got 50 pounds of lithium in the ground and I want a buck, you know, a buck a pound and it's worth 50. We're so far beyond that. This is a world class asset. I mean, to have the tonnages matching up with the grades that we're seeing, you know, and again, I, I can't find anything else in Nevada that's frankly even close. And remembering that this thing continues in three in three different directions, and we're nowhere near our, our claim boundaries, right? So, you know, again, do we have to prove that we're even bigger and better? Now, don't really think that that's necessarily the best use of the dollars. Now, we want to sort of integrate this all into a into a holistic type of a thing, which is going to culminate in this updated PEA. Then I think you know everybody would have a better d uh, point to make a decision as to what the value is, and then ultimately. You know, which of a different couple of uh, of an exit points maybe do you want to do you necessarily want to use? Um, but there's m there are many different ways, and I'm not even giving you. You know, there's probably three, four different variations to take a carried interest. You know, do you know boron? We haven't talked about maybe somebody does want to buy. Uh, you know, or take a royalty on boron or sell off take on boron. Of course, we want to sell off take on lithium, but all of these types of things would be in advance of our. You know in advance of the final culmination of shareholder value for current um, Nevada Lithium shareholders is the way I would put it. They're, they would be stepping stones uh, before the decision to whether or not, hey, this is the proper time uh, you know, to, to basically do a deal or, or to build it. We, we have a while to go. So I'm yeah. sorry, again, long-winded. I, I guess uh, as a 20 year veteran of the Vancouver junior mining scene, when you say to me, uh, are you going to build a mine or, or do a deal? The answer is definitely yes. Yes. And that's exactly what I've heard over 30 years in New York. So I, so everybody's talking the same language. Every, anything is possible. And that's the way you want to keep it. I see a few questions here associated with analyst coverage. So I suppose to, to consolidate them again here, what do you think the catalyst would be that would trigger an increase in analyst coverage? In my opinion, it's it's really it depends, of course, if it's Canadian or if it's um, U.S. I think there would be dif different characteristics because I think that the Canadian investors have always been a little bit earlier uh, into what's going on um, than the U.S. investors. I mean, we all know everybody's been involved with you know biotech and uh, you know and cannabis and everything else for, for God knows how many years. Um, but I think, first of all, the updated PEA is certainly going to be helpful because it's going to be a refreshed look at something that has completely changed form, right? I mean, this has been, I, I sort of look at this as a one-year, you know, not a detour, but a one-year we had to go back and in, in a circle and start again because we had to see what we had here. And I think it's been a worthwhile trade-off of time. I think that's one thing. I think certainly lithium sentiment right now is something that all the banks are, are, are waiting for. I mean, you know, obviously we're, when we talk to them, we want to get into research coverage lists. We have a small market capitalization. Uh, we're working on accessibility for European investors because I think they're a little bit farther ahead, frankly, uh, than even the Canadian investors. Um, but, you know, until we see, I think, lithium prices get off the floor and, you know, get out of their own way, 
it's it's going to be a little bit rough. However, in my opinion, I think that's going to start to happen sooner rather than later. And I think it's going to be a culmination of you, you see what the car companies are doing right now. Look at what Ford, the big article about them, Stellantis, other car companies, you know, have said they're buying these Chinese cars. Right. And they're re, they're reverse engineering them. Right. To see how to build these electric cars uh, in a way that could be profitable. I mean, frankly, they already know that because all they do is look at Tesla. But it's going to be a big change for those those car companies. But I think they understand it, even if the mandates get rolled back a bit. You know, I mean, clearly the capabilities of the EVs are getting better. You know, everything in range, reliability. If you want to have something, I, I think it's very interesting anyway. You want to keep track of sort of what's going on in China and their cars. Go on YouTube. Look at a guy called the, uh, the Electric Viking. I don't know him at all. He's just a guy who puts out a couple of, of videos every day, five, six minutes, really in tune with what's going on about all the cars that are coming out. You won't hear about it in the U.S. press. My only point in saying that is that the technology of all of this stuff is advancing very, very rapidly, not only with the consumer products, meaning the EVs, but also, again, the battery technology going into the stationary storage devices. I will tell you that on the processing side, the direct lithium extraction folks, right? They started, of course, with brine. They're working right now on the hard rock, the spodumene stuff. And again, in Australia and Quebec, they're coming to me and talking about saying, hey, we think we could do this for, um, for the clays, right? Again, this is, again, analogous to what I've been talking about to people over the last three years or so. Three years ago, never, but nobody thought these clays were going to be necessary to supply global demand. They're going to be necessary. So you're seeing all of these changes, and it's a complicated subject. And the long-winded way of saying this, I know that the analysts have a hard time trying to keep up. And remember, for the banks and everything like that, they're going to start where, where they can do business, right? What's their investment banking arm going to say we need to do a deal? It's not like in the old days where you had, you know, you basically had coverage. People stopped paying for basically research coverage a long time ago. That's why investors are out in the woods about this. Why I sort of try to put my spin on it from, you know, from my prior life. But, you know, I think, again, I think the PEA, people won't be able to ignore that. I think certainly lithium prices. One other thing I'll just say about lithium prices. What happens if the Chinese just arbitrarily say, hey, you know what? Lithium is a strategic mineral, just like they did with antimony not long ago, right? 80% of the world, all of the lithium, one form or another, either upgrading capacity or the, you know, the primary source is controlled by China. Total game changer. That could be something that brings everybody into it. And again, I think the U.S. markets, we're going to need to be a little bit mature. We're talking to a lot of different people. I met a lot more different people out in Los Angeles from the U.S. side of things. They're aware of us, but there's a difference between people being aware of us and being in a coverage list. And that's an arcane subject I could go in, you know, at a later point in time. But those are the types of things I think that we, we really need to see. And yeah, I would echo what Stephen's saying. The lithium price is going to uh, sort of uh, under my, uh, uh, sort of underpin any kind of change in sentiment. The PEA, uh, maybe once we do the the, the, the borehole drilling test, that will be a, a big catalyst for change. Um, but you know, in the spring, once we get through uh, Roundup and uh, PDAC, we'll we'll have a feeling of the sentiment at that point. And I think. Um, Canada has traditionally, the analysts in Canada don't have a, a huge depth on lithium, especially for sedimentary lithium at the moment. But I think that is changing and uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll be the beneficiary of that going forward. Yeah, those are excellent points. And, and, and to again, remember, if you go back at the way we were talking about this three years ago, two and a half years ago, the world, in particular the OEMs, right, the car companies thought that the direct lithium extraction, that was a panacea. That was going to solve everybody's problems. So, hey, you know, hard rock, well, what's that? Yeah, we sort of understand that. Clays, no, we don't even know what that's about. Things are changing very, very quickly. So I, I think in research coverage, you know, we have the potential to, uh, you know, look, people can't ignore the size of what we have now. They just can't. Uh, and I think that's going to play in our favor. <laughs> Amazing. Folks, we have time for one last question. Uh, thank you so much for everyone who participated in the chat or submitted questions early. Uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, if we didn't get to your question, we promise to pass them along to the team and hopefully they can address it uh, at a later date. Uh, but last question here before I pass it back to you, Steve, for final words. Uh, can you expand on Bonnie Claire and how it compares to other deposits in the U.S. and the world and the qualities that differentiate this asset for potential strategic investment by other corporates across the lithium supply chain? 
Yeah, I mean, complicated question, obviously. And remembering, everybody has to remember this, right? We've got different types of um, different types of lithium being produced, right? You got the brines, right? All the solars, which you got one set of economic constraints, uh, advantages, disadvantages, obviously water, all sorts of things going on with them. Then you have the hard rock, you know, coming out in Australia, and again, the ability who's going to convert that stuff from, you know, concentrate, uh, you know, into a usable battery material. You know, those refineries cost billions of dollars, et cetera, a lot of Chinese ownership in these types of things. And then we finally come to the clays. You know, at first blush, we really have yet to find anything in the U.S. that can compare to Bonnie Claire. I mean, again, in tonnage, we haven't seen it. Uh, our folks, have, you know, we, we diligently try to go through uh, all of the projects and, uh, you know, and their characteristics, tonnage, grades, et cetera. Hey, some people are going to have more, you know, measured and indicated. Some people are going to have proven all this sorts of stuff. But if, if you just look at the resource side and you look at the continuity of what we have, I don't see what else compares, uh, you know, and if you wanted to, to go up to the very north of the state, you know, and, and I would just say within the state of Nevada, I think we're going to be the largest because I think some of the stuff up north probably goes up past the state lines. It, but it's sort of a it's, it's just a it's a bit of a parlor game to, to play who's the biggest and who's the best. I haven't seen the grades uh, that we've been putting out, certainly haven't seen them with the intercept. Uh, you know, uh, distances that we're talking about with hundreds of meters, you know, hundreds and hundreds of feet of this three, 4,000 uh, PPM type of material. So we think it's among the world's best. I mean, there are all sorts of constraints in the, in the other places of the world with regards to state-owned entities owning them. Again, Chinese ownership, and, and, and these all come into play when you have the IRA-compliant uh, IRA and, and IRA-non-compliant world, right? So you got to take these into account. Nevada is perennially one of the best mining jurisdictions in the world. You know, in a little bit of a you know round trip here, let's just say over the past 10 years, we have catapulted this project from something that was already arguably one of the best to something that I don't even think you can argue is one of the best. The really the only constraint is we've had is lithium price sentiment. We've just been on the wrong side of it. Okay, that's fine. That's going to change. We've talked about, about, about that a lot of times in, in past videos. But when you look at the overall picture, everything, again, from where it is, no risk of expropriation, the state of Nevada and the governor saying we want all of this to occur here, to where we are, uh, you know, to uh, putting a finished product again, right? For now, we're talking about a finished product going into a, into a battery. Maybe there will be other ways that we can address, you know, address that too and work with some sort of a DLE if technology comes along. We're not going to put anything out there and say that, you know, it's not possible. The optionality on this project is off the charts, not only in those ways I just mentioned, but everything from, hey, again, we're, this, we're over the size of Manhattan Island. We're, we're basically exploring, right? Where? And I said this before, Midtown Manhattan, the resource covers that. But really, if you look at our drilling footprint, it's like the theater district. It's just so small, and we have so much more that we could do. That kind of optionality investors will pay for over time. Do we have brine? We don't know for sure that we don't. We have a structure that seems to run you know, all the way up to Albemarle Silver Peak. Give us an analog. We don't know. So in terms of Bonnie Claire versus everything else, I just, you know, when you tick all those boxes, I don't know if it's the best, but I'm pretty damn sure that it's got to be one of the best. And I know that we're undervalued in terms of market capitalization. And again, we're just starting to tell the story in a world where nobody cares about lithium, right? So we're going to continue to do the work. We're going to get there. We'll get up the other side of the Lasan curve. You know, this thing is a beast and we have not seen the last of what she has to offer. So, you know, we have a game plan set out in the near term. We have a long term, a longer term game plan. We have to execute, got to finance. But I think we have very, very good chances to basically create a hell of a lot of shareholder value for everybody, certainly from where we are now. Uh, and I'll just say that uh, we have 25.6 million tons of lithium carbonate uh, inferred. 5 million tons of indicated, uh, and we're open in three directions, and I'll leave it to others to uh, uh, for their thoughts about where how we compare to others. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you both, Steve, Jeff. Uh, appreciate your time and for uh, all these insights. A big thank you to everyone who attended uh, both live and for those of you watching the replay. Um, I will pass it back to you, Steve, for the final word.
I've said enough. I'm sure everybody's certainly had enough. Thanks, Bianca. Obviously, everybody knows. Reach out to to us uh, with further questions or to six uh, excellent hosts for these webinars, um, and uh, we'll make sure that we get them answered for you. Very much appreciate your time. Take care of yourselves. Mm -hmm.